Hello, everybody. Thank you so much for joining us today. My name is Ryan and welcome to Central Park. We here at the Central Park Conservancy are thrilled to continue to bring the park to you through plenty of in-person as well as virtual programs like our longer, more in-depth 45-minute virtual programs, as well as our casual 15-minute weekly walks every Wednesday at 1230. Thank you so much for joining us today for another rendition of our weekly walk where we explore various landscapes or themes within Central Park. And today we have a really fun one to explore. We're going to explore the oldest human-made structure in Central Park, which is the obelisk. Of course, on our walk today, we're going to have a few other things we're going to see as we make our way through the park, eventually ending over at the obelisk. We're going to be together for about 15 minutes, and as always, just about all the photos you're going to see were taken by myself here in Central Park over the past week. With the exception of just a few photos that I accessed through various databases, such as the Museum of the City of New York, the Metropolitan Photo Archives, as well as the Central Park Conservancy's Photo Archives. Again, thank you so much for joining us today for a weekly walk of the obelisk with me, Ryan, on today, January 19th. 2022. Now, as we jump into our program, you're probably familiar with us here at the Central Park Conservancy if you've joined us on past weekly walks. But if this is your first walk, welcome. We're the nonprofit organization that cares for Central Park, helping to preserve all the beautiful statues, monuments, landscapes, and history, as well as helping to raise 75% 75 75 of the park's roughly $70 million annual operating budget. And we certainly couldn't keep the park looking so clean and green without you. Our mission is to preserve and celebrate Central Park as a sanctuary from the pace and pressures of city life, enhancing the enjoyment and well-being of all. Now, as we move into our tour, we of course are using Zoom. So if anybody would like to maybe uh, jot down a favorite memory of the park or maybe something that interests you about the obelisk for the Metropolitan, since those are gonna be heavily talked about in our walk today, you can share that in the chat feature. Let us know where you're joining us from and a favorite memory you might have in the park. If you do have a question, please use the Q&A feature, and uh, my colleague Jose will be on the back end answering any questions you might have. The last thing you'll see pop up are some visitor polls that I'll launch throughout the tour today. Once everybody has voted in those, I can end them, and share the results, and we can see what everybody's thinking. Now, without any further ado, let's jump in today's weekly walk of the obelisk. Today we have a pretty long walk to take, but of course it's a little chilly out there, so we want to move around and warm up as much as possible. We'll begin our walk around East 84th Street, starting to enter the park and eventually making our way to the oldest human-made object in Central Park, which is going to be the obelisk. As we adventure through the park, we can start on this very chilly day along Fifth Avenue near 84th Street just slightly north of the Metropolitan Museum, which we can sort of see blocked off on the right-hand side of this photo, covered up by a lot of the beautiful elm trees that reside along Fifth Avenue. Before we make our way into the park, there's something immediately in front of us that certainly captures our, probably all of ours, but certainly my attention as we're standing over here. And it is the ancient playground, but more specifically the Osborne Gates, which sit just outside of the ancient playground, located around 84th and 5th Avenue. These Osborne Gates are truly a work of art. They did once sit actually just outside of a playground that once existed where today's Metropolitan Museum of Art is. Of course, new renovations would occur in the Metropolitan Museum of Art, forcing some things to move around in the park. But today we can find these beautiful Osborne gates situated just outside of the ancient playground. These beautiful gates were sculpted by Paul Manship, a sculptor who we can see works of throughout Central Park as well as throughout New York City. Anybody that's visited um, the Rockefeller Center area might have seen Prometheus, that beautiful statue that is located just near the skating rink. That is one of the more famous works by Paul Manship. But we can see several in the park, such as the Titch Children's Zoo gates. But these gates that we see here are certainly very whimsical and beautiful. They all feature different types of detail that are taken from stories from Aesop's tales. Uh, Aesop being a storyteller that was thought to live um, really in Greece back around 600 BC. So certainly some interesting works and fables that we see depicted in these beautiful sculptings. One thing that always draws my attention on this piece is actually one of the top pillars along the left or south side of the gate. You might notice this group of bears on top of the pillar, and it might look a little familiar. 
if you visited other areas of Central Park, such as about four blocks south from here near the Friedman Playground, you might have noticed this group of bear statues, which stands just outside the Pat Hoffman Friedman Memorial Playground. These group of bears were actually sculpted by Paul Manship as well. They actually originally were first sculpted for the Paul J. Rainey Memorial Gateway up at the Bronx area. We would eventually see this gate, which was very detailed and very costly, producing some other smaller casts to help generate money for this large project. We'd see Paul Manship rearranging some of the bears used in that gateway to create this piece that we see here. Although this would actually be a second or third casting. We'd originally see the gateway being created between about 1926 and 1934, with another casting of those three bears being created just a year or so after. We would see this uh, sculpting right here coming around 1960, but not making its way to the park until about 1993. If you do travel around New York and certain areas of the United States, you can actually see several casts of the statue. This would actually be about the fourth casting, while we can see the second casting really occurring and actually finding a home in the Metropolitan Museum of Art. The last casting you'll see, or actually the second to last, is another smaller scale model that's actually housed in the Smithsonian Design Museum. We'll also see an even later casting coming around 2008 that's actually found over in Bentonville, Arkansas. Certainly a lot of different bears that you can see around Central Park and around the United States. That leads me to my first poll, which is how many bears or how many group of bears statues have you encountered? Of course, you'll have about four or so that can be found in or around Central Park. One that's over in the Bronx at the um, Bronx Zoo, as well as one that's in Bentonville, Arkansas. So we'll let everybody vote in that as we start to move along from these groups of bears, which certainly are very whimsical and a great way to start our walk. While we're over here too, though, we have to appreciate the ancient playground, one of the various style of adventure playgrounds in the park. These are meant to break away from traditional playground equipment and provide a more interactive, creative form of play. They also have some really amazing features in uh, each of these playgrounds. This one in particular, we can see there's actually an obelisk within this small playground situated in the back corner. A really fun way to start off our tour since we're walking to the obelisk today. And seeing these pictures up a little bit closer, we can see that obelisk serves as a small slide for toddlers, as well as a sandbox and potentially a little chalkboard to use along the sides. These interactive plays are a great way to combine really elements of history with children's play. As we move away from ancient playground, which opened up around 1993, we can start making our way into the park, walking along one of the many renovated sides of the Metropolitan Museum of Art. And in that big glass window we can see over there is the Temple of Dendor. This area was actually added around 1970. And prior to this, there was a playground that once existed over here, being um, a playground that would honor William Church Osborne, the uh, reason the gates are named the Osborne Gates. We would eventually see when this hall was being constructed, the playground getting demolished and eventually an uh, ancient playground opening up around eight, uh, 1993. During time, that's the Osborne Gates actually coming out of storage, being stored and put back in front of that playground. As we make our way through the park though, we can start coming up along this wintry drive, an area we have visited in the past. And as we come up during this season in the winter, we can remember what this view looked like back in April when we took a walk to the reservoir around April 21st, 2021. Certainly a lot more color, but we can certainly enjoy that the park is a little bit more open and less people are visiting on this chilly day. We can also enjoy, of course, some of the evergreen colors we get as we walk along this area, making our way just past the Metropolitan now and making our way into the park along the east side drive. We'll actually head up north for now. And as we walk up the path, we can come to one of the only straight paths you'll find in Central Park. The only intentionally straight path created was the mall down around 70th Street, but we will find some other paths due to features that we'll see in just a few moments, creating these straight paths in some sections of the park. As we make our way up, we come to what is Engineer's Gate here in Central Park. 
And as we make our way to Engineers Gate, I do want to end that poll and share the results. And actually, surprisingly, a um, majority of people have seen the Metropolitan Museum of Art group of bears statue rather than one of the two or so that we'll find here in Central Park. And of course, there's ones located all around. You can go up to the Bronx and see the one at the Paul J. Rainey Gates. You can see two here in Central Park, one in the Metropolitan, one down in um, DC, as well as one in Bentonville, Arkansas. So if you haven't seen some of the ones in the park or abroad, I certainly encourage you to add those to your Central Park bucket list and check out these historic works of art in person. You'll also notice too, if you see those works up close, that they're not very, very detailed compared to some statues. And that's again, because these were originally created for gates that, would, that were gonna stand about 30 feet tall. So seeing it from 20 feet uh, below, probably wouldn't be able to pick up too many details anyway. As we start making our way into Engineer's Gate or entering uh, closer to this area, we can enjoy another piece of engineering art that exists over this area, the reservoir. And then before we get to the reservoir, we're greeted by this nice little memorial for John Peroy Mitchell. John Peroy Mitchell was a mayor for New York City between about 1914 and 1917. He would actually lose his second uh, re-election and would enlist in the Air Force. During that time, unfortunately, um, meeting his demise, suffering an injury and dying actually in the Air Force. We would eventually see this memorial coming around 1929. And one of the reasons this memorial sits up here at Engineers Gate is because under John Proy Mitchell's mayoral reign, we would see the first of three water tunnels opening up around 1970, 1917 rather. Um, we would see actually the third water tunnel in this project being completed this past year in 2021. So really amazing to see this very long capital project in New York finally coming to an end. Over here, we can enjoy this um, interesting little memorial area, which was created by Thomas Hastings, the sculptor and architect who would also create the Pulitzer Fountain down near um, Grand Army Plaza. We'd also see Adolph Alexander Weinman completing this bust of John Peroy Mitchell, but serving as an interesting, uh, very nice ornamental welcome to the reservoir area. And as we make our way just up the stairs, staircase, we can walk just along the reservoir for a little while, enjoying this wonderful work of art and very big engineering project. As we make our way down here, seeing the southern gatehouse to the reservoir, I do want to launch a second poll for the tour today. This is one that is more opinionated, but I just want to see what everybody thinks. What do you think the most impressive architectural or engineering feat in Central Park is? There's quite a lot, but I've only uh, included three of the major ones. The reservoir, the Croton Aqueduct System, which transported water 32 miles south, helping to supply New York with clean drinking water. Just amazing engineering uh, principles there. The obelisk, of course, which we're going to go see, which weighs over 220 tons and which they raised back in 1881, basically using a pole and levee system, which I can never fathom. And then, of course, creating Central Park, um, really making a human constructed park from scratch. Certainly something that's um, pretty hard to imagine, but I'll everybody vote in that as we make our way just past the reservoir. Coming over to bridge number 24, one of the three cast iron bridges you'll find around the reservoir area. This actually being one of three bridges that don't have a specific name here in the park. Just about every other bridge or arch was named. However, these three that you will find along the reservoir, uh, number 24, 27 and I believe 26 are located just around the reservoir area. Here we can see bridge number 24, a beautiful cast iron ornamental bridge. And what I always love with the architecture in the park, we can always find some type of connection to nature. Looking at bridge number 24 as we're walking on top, I always see these crests which remind me of wildlife. Specifically, I always get uh, the impression of an owl, maybe a great horned owl, like we can see pictured here, which add again that nice natural connection to this human made architecture. And one that certainly inspires us, especially in wintertime, where we can actually see owls like great horned owls here in Central Park. But of course, uh, definitely takes a little bit of work to spot an owl. 
As we make our way just around the path, we can also enjoy some of the lush green, which help to cover up some of the less inviting sites. And as we pass by here, we can see how some of the laburnum, holly, rhododendron, and yew form a wall of green, blocking out things we don't want to see, such as buildings, as well as cars like 86th Street Transverse Road, which is running just below us. We didn't stop and pay attention. We probably wouldn't even realize there's traffic going just underneath us. A beautiful design of the creators of Central Park, Calvert Box and Frederick Law Olmsted, and one that is very heavily applicable to the park today in helping to create this immersive feeling that we typically experience when coming to the park. We didn't come here to see traffic though, so we'll keep walking along, making our way that much closer to our final destination of the Apples. As we make our way down the park, we can walk under this nice low-lying branch, which serves as a little tunnel to our next location. And as we make our way down, we can start to see that big, beautiful building-looking piece of architecture here in the park. And as we start to make our way to the obelisk and talk more about it, I do want to share the results from that last poll. And we can see that a lot of people actually, of course, think Central Park is probably one of the craziest engineering feats that we have. And certainly would agree with you, really, any of these answers are certainly amazingly impressive and, again, unfathomable, typically, even for me, somebody that knows a lot about Central Park but certainly um, a lot of really amazing discoveries, creations, and engineering works that can be found or discovered in New York City and Central Park. As we make our way to the obelisk, we can again enjoy this beautiful view, heading just south of the obelisk to get a little bit more sunny of a view. And what we can notice over here is this clearer landscape. Before we talk about this beautiful obelisk, we can notice a small restoration project we at the Conservancy have done, which was simply clearing out the landscape, opening up the view a little bit more. Because with this big, beautiful, ancient work of art, we certainly don't want it to be covered up and we want it to be more visible as we come through the park. As we make our way up to the base of this obelisk, we can start to dive into the history of this 220 ton piece of pink asmonite granite that stands about 69 feet tall and is the oldest human-made object in the park, coming in at about 3,500 years old. Uh, these were actually, or this obelisk rather, was presented to New York City by the Khedive of Egypt, Ismail Pasha, around, nine, around 1870, rather, um, really of the Suez Canal. We see this certainly very tall, beautiful work of art, again, standing about 69 feet tall and actually serving as a um, dedication to the sun god Amun-Ra, having been created originally by a ruling pharaoh, Tutmos III, who would put some of his exploits and um, conquerings on this obelisk in the form of hieroglyphics. Certainly a hard piece to capture the entire deal, but here we can get a full look at this obelisk. We later see Ramses II, another ruling pharaoh, adding some of his hieroglyphics on there, uh, to detailing some of his conquerings and exploits. Really amazing piece, though. We would eventually see it being toppled over in Heliopolis, the sun city of Egypt, where it once stood, just a little bit north of Cairo. Eventually, we see this piece actually being rediscovered by the Romans around 12 BCE. We would see them actually sailing these two obelisks, because there was a twin to this one, down the Nile River and being eventually installed in Alexandria, Cleopatra City, over at a temple that was actually dedicated to Julius Caesar. We actually see the temple being built by Cleopatra, which is likely why these have the name Cleopatra's Needle, rather than just the obelisk. We do see in the 1870s, one being gifted to England and one to New York City. We would eventually see this being erected here in January of 1881. And the obelisk certainly has a lot of really amazing detail. For one, we can actually read what the hieroglyphics are translated to on little plaques around each base of each side of the obelisk. Uh, what I always find even more impressive than the transcribing of the hieroglyphics, though, is the journey this obelisk went to get to Central Park. After being gifted, we would eventually see a bunch of different theories as to how to transport this. Um, London's obelisk was basically encapsulated by a big, almost submarine-looking sheet of metal and then dragged by a boat. But unfortunately, they ran to a storm and the obelisk separated from the boat and actually was drifting around the water. Luckily, they were able to get it and salvage it in the days coming. So thinking as to how to transport our obelisk, 
we actually had a genius idea coming from a general, um, General um, Honey Church Gurringe. And General Honey Church Gurringe came up with an ingenious idea to cut a hole in the bottom of the ship that would transport it, slide it in, and weld it back up. This might seem crazy, but it was actually the best idea because putting an obelisk on the top of the ship would actually really ruin the weight of it and it would cause the ship to capsize if it hit a mild wave. So by doing this, it created a very stable base in the ship and allowed the transport to go very smoothly as the obelisk would be transported up the Hudson River, eventually ending somewhere near uh, the west side of Central Park. Once the obelisk arose to the Isle of Manhattan, this was the challenging part. It would take 112 days for the obelisk to travel only a few miles to its current location. We would see a railroad actually being created to help transport it. And luckily the funding for the transportation of the obelisk and this railroad was handled by Cornelius Vanderbilt. So with a Vanderbilt handling the railroad system, it certainly was a breeze, even though it took some time. Pushing this obelisk and drawing it with a lot of people as well as horse-drawn carriages and ox, moving it a few feet each day, disassembling the railroad behind it and reassembling it in front of the obelisk, eventually making its way over to Central Park. We would see around January 22nd, 1881, this obelisk being hoisted into position. And one of the most amazing engineering feats in the park I can think of is certainly this, we, uh, lifting this 220 ton piece using no more than this more simple and primitive kind of pulley system that we see here. Many, many uh, thousands of people, I believe um, upwards of eight to 10,000 people actually came out to witness this obelisk's mass uh, journey to sit upright. And of course it today currently sits upright, but what comes comes as a surprise to a lot of people is that the only thing holding it down is really gravity. It is positioned very perfectly on these bronze crabs, which we can see, which hold it in place. These bronze crabs were actually uh, originally created by the Romans after rediscovering these obelisks in order to secure it and make it stand correctly. The ones we see here today are actually replicas that were created in the late 1800s by some engineers over at the Brooklyn Navy Yard. Some of the original crabs created by the Romans, which actually represent really a connection to the sun and heavens, very appropriate for this piece, can be found over in the Metropolitan Museum of Art today. One of the last things I find so interesting about this piece is that the pedestal itself not only weighs a lot, but holds a very special secret inside. Inside of this pedestal, one would find a time capsule that was dedicated upon uh, this obelisk installation. In the time capsule, you'll find the complete works of Shakespeare, uh, the Bible works. You'll find a census from 1880, New York. You'll find a tourist guidebook to Egypt, as well as a box that contains some Masonic symbols, as well as a mystery. There is one box inside of this that no one knows the contents of, except one Masonic leader who was uh, crucial in helping to raise this obelisk, setting it in the exact same parameters um, and degrees as it once stood over in Egypt, as well as putting this mystery box inside that no one knows what's in it. So maybe one day we can see this um, time capsule opened up and we can learn even more about what it was like when this 1881 engineering feat was completed. As we make our way to the end of our tour though, I want to really appreciate this obelisk and all it's been through. Standing in New York City is no easy feat as the urban climate certainly affects a lot of these ancient works of art. And we can actually see part of this restoration project we completed between 2011 and 2014 here. We can see surveying of the obelisk. One thing I always like to point out in this photo is you can notice the base of the obelisk or the top point of it rather is bare. It doesn't have any hieroglyphics. Not because that's because it was traditionally covered with gold plating on top to help reflect the sunlight and again, make that connection. This really obelisk serving as a pillar and connection between the sun and the heavens and earth. So we see a really interesting uh, view we typically don't get to see. These pictures are also coming from the New York Times who wrote a wonderful article detailing the um, obelisk restoration. A wonderful article if anybody would like to read it. But what we can see in this photo is some of the 
um, technology used for this restoration, using infrared lasers to very carefully and sensitively remove all of this debris and pollution that had built up on this obelisk for its over 130 year existence here in the park. But really an amazing work of art that was preserved thanks to modern day technologies, keeping it clean and visible for countless generations to enjoy. And of course, this obelisk and the Metropolitan um, certainly are very important features that we have around the park today. And they both interestingly came around the same time. The original museum, um, Metropolitan Museum opening around 70, 1872, but existed, existing more south on Fifth Avenue, eventually changing locations another time or two, and eventually ending up here in Central Park in 1880. We would see the obelisk coming the year after in 1881, helping to bridge that connection of really amazing ancient civilization history existing here in New York. And today, of course, the Metropolitan has undergone several different renovations since we no longer can see this original face along the um, west side of it. However, today we are lucky in New York to have one of the most immense collections of ancient Egyptian artifacts and history in the world. So we're really excited to have this obelisk finding its home just beyond the Metropolitan Museum here in arguably the greatest public work um, in all of the world, Central Park. As we come to the end of our tour today, again, I want to thank everybody for joining us and hopefully learning a little bit more about an area or an object you may have seen countless times over. This is the route we took today. If anybody would like to recreate the walk, seeing the Osborne Gate, making your way up to Engineer Gate, over Bridge Number 24, and eventually to the Obelisk, which of course packs an immense amount of history. There's plenty of other ways to learn about the Obelisk as well. If you do check the chat box, my colleague Jose will share some links on our pages about some restoration work we did, as well um, as you can look into the New York Times article relating to the Obelisk restoration between 2000 2011 and 2014. Um, once again, everybody, thank you so much for joining us. I hope you had fun and learned a little bit about Central Park and some of the rich history it holds. And of course, we're going to continue to doing continue to do virtual programs. Uh, we're going to be doing in-person tours as we've commenced for a while now, as well as continuing these weekly walks and longer 45-minute virtual programs. You do check the chat box. My colleague Jose will drop some links for our upcoming tours page. We do have Belvedere, beautiful view tomorrow, iconic views Friday, another winter tree tour on Sunday, and plenty of other in-person and virtual programming for you. So thank you so much for the support and for joining us today. And we hope to uh, see you down the road on some more programs. I'll leave this room open for a little bit longer in case there's any questions we can uh, get to that we have not answered. But thank you again for joining us. And from all of us here at the Central Park Conservancy, stay safe, be well, and we'll see you soon.